You're sitting in the back room of a theater, dressed in heavy black robes, your luscious red hair contained by a thick hood, nibbing on an iced coffee. Behind you, an imbos positioned next to the door, with a professional expression, trying his damnness to not as much as look at you. The silence in the room occasionally interrupted by the sounds of your drinking. You had awoken early today. It wasn't often that you were called for a job. There was a certain anxiousness that you felt. Mistakes, blunders, screwing up. The theatrics always made you feel terrible for weeks. Though it had been a while since the last time you did that. Nonchalantly, you began expecting your right wrist. As if the little hidden claw beneath your skin had vanished since the last time you checked. Pressing on a barely visible skin pouch, the black stinger shot out of your skin. It was a shiny obsidian black. A tiny, almost unnoticeable hole at its furthest tip. You had tried stabbing yourself with it once, though it seemed like you were immune to your own power. It just really hurt. Five more minutes, Miss Blackwall, said the imp after checking his watch. You attracted the stinger by fully straightening your hand. It was good that you purposefully needed to touch the little skin pouch, otherwise this thing could have been quite inconvenient when it came to personal contacts, as well as sleeping. You leaned back in your chair, sighing loudly. When had it been again? Two days ago? Four? Perhaps a week. That was your minimum requirement for your recruitment contracts, though you had trouble keeping up with dates. You lived at the top floor of an amazing apartment tower, right in the middle of the gang territory of Carmilla Carmine though you didn't have any preferences when it came to the overlords. After all, you needed to remain neutral, part of the job. Camilla just had more classy accommodations than most, and she always was a little more generous when it came to jobs. Really, sometimes you saw yourself as her third daughter with how well she treated you. Of course, you never say that out loud or to her face. She slit your tongue. You had lazily been drifting in and out of sleep when the call came. You had been lying on an inflatable mattress inside your pool. For the great luxury you experienced in hell, you were expected to jump onto any job. That's why you were here. The five minutes were over, and the imp opened the door, allowing you passage. Like the image of death itself, you made your way through a dim yet lavishly decorated hallway, covered in posters of plays and movies you had never seen. Most of them hell productions, though some of them, such as Casablanca, came from Earth. After taking your final breath, you stepped onto the stage. Your first look went over the audience. Only a handful of the most powerful overlords had gathered. Most of them sitting in the front row, aside from two of them. Hmm, let's see. Who's here? There were the V's, all three of them. Rosie, of course. Zessiel never skipped a performance. Two members of the Eldritch family, and far in the back, sitting with a young blonde woman, said... Alistair the Radio Demon? Ah, uh, you haven't seen him in seven years. Ah, uh, good to see an old friend. Well, friend wasn't really the right word. Acquaintance? Finally, your eyes went over the person chained on a singular chair in the middle of the stage, all lights of the theater pointing at them. It was a woman. She had beautiful orange skin blue lips and blonde hair. She was dressed like one of Valentino's girls, with white freckles and green eyes. You remained out of sight of her, while everyone else was staring at you with bated breaths. 
What was happening here? This wasn't a play. No. You approached the chained woman from behind. She shivered and started screaming as she finally noticed you. Gently you slid the back of your hand down her cheek. Patiently, Rosie leaned forward, taking out her theater glasses to exactly see the facial reactions of the bound woman. A loud popping noise rang through the theater as Valentina opened a bottle of alcohol. But everyone was too enamored by what was happening on stage to be bothered by it. This wasn't a play. No. This was an execution. The demoness before you must have committed a grave sin that presumably all overlords gathered here desired this woman's demise, or at least democratically agreed on this being proper punishment. Well, considering Alistair was sitting still in the theater, there was the certain exception that he was just here for sick pleasure and would have agreed to any execution. To stop the woman screaming, you placed her hand on her chin, clapping her jaws shut. You inspected her carefully. She was a very basic demoness, sinner born, no special features aside from her discolored skin and strange looking eyes, looking a little like those of horses. She had two small horns poking out of her forehead. They had signs of being cut. Who was it again who ordered her to be executed? Aya hey, Vox, right, the TV demon. Just in case your eyes started over to him, he was leaning forward in his chair, his mouth was turned into a vile grin. Eyes not even blinking. Well, better not keep the audience waiting. The tension could be cut with a knife. Besides, this wasn't your first time in this specific place of execution. Normally it was some dingy serial killer like basement or an interrogation room beneath a nightclub. Each overlord having their own execution place. Vox, the TV demon, was one for theatrics, so perhaps that's why he used this old opera-style theater for it. I'm going to explain what will happen to you. Even though you spoke directly into the ear of your victim, everyone in the theater heard your voice. It was thanks to the microphone attached to the rope given to you by Vox. I don't know why you have been called for execution. Nor do I care. Remain quiet. This will make the process more easy on all of us. Your grip on the woman's chin slowly lessened. While she stopped screaming in fear, she now threw herself against her restraints, but to no avail. The chair was bolted to the floor, her powers, if she had any, suppressed by her shackles. You shook your head. Well, to be fair, you were dead the second they put me on this, you muttered. No point in fighting. So about this. See, sometimes tearing a soul apart is enough for dear makers. Sometimes they want a more permanent solution. You're probably wondering how. Chuckling, you hugged her from behind, placing your chin on her shoulder and smiling. See, we have to be creative down here in H E double L. Physical harm is out of the question, as that only leads to regenerations. The same thing goes with poison, eventually it's out of the system. Smirking, you kissed her neck. Her skin tasted pleasant, was quite warm. Such a shame. For a moment you forgot you were in the theater. Sharing an intimate moment with the woman you are about to kill. But there are other means. Addiction is a really popular one. Sometimes forced. Practically always forced if we use it as an execution method. Uh, Zestiel's adopted daughter can make you want to self-delete over and over again whenever you regenerate. Though technically you can recover from that. And if you can suppress it enough, you can live... A miserable life, after decades, maybe. 
and then there's memory removal. It's one that Carmilla really likes to use, but... Your hands move down to the woman's curvy body. My niece worries. You let go of her, walking around her, until you're face to face with her. You're pressed into the skin pouch, your stinger shooting out. It glistened in the stage lights. See, memory removal still technically allows the gaining of new memories. Of a new self. New person. Sure, the demon might be reduced to a newborn intelligence and knowledge-wise, but you can come back from that eventually. And in very rare cases, the memories just suddenly return. That is a possibility. Even though memory parasites devour the memories whole, it just happens. You went down on one knee, placing both hands on her thighs, making sure to scrape her skin with the stinger as you did. What I do, you can never come back from. You said in a serious tone while staying right into her eyes, and then you smiled up at her. Tell me, sweetie, what is your best personality trait? Uh, what? She hushed. To her, this felt more. To her, this felt very out of context, but it was important. I, I suppose I'm quite self-sufficient. Well, at least she taught you an extra personality trait. It was rare that in hell somebody actually told you a personality trait. Ugh. Gently you patted her left knee with your right hand. Good answer. With an evil grin you stood up and walked behind her again. And you gently brushed the back of your fingers against her cheek. Soon this will all be over. But don't worry. I seldom get any complaints. The girl's eyes contracted out of fear. Placing her left onto her head. She froze. Her gaze forward. And finally. You placed the long black stinger against her neck. Her body wiggled out of fear. But there was no way out of this. It pierced her skin. Her body shivering in pain. You pushed forward. Drilling. Shoving. Tearing. Until you felt the resistance of her spine. And then the instance it made contact with her bones, it happened. The woman's body convulsed. She screamed, but it was no longer in pain. Everybody could tell. It was as if the second the needle touched her bones, everything was turned upside down. Every neuron in her body fired. It was the most intense feeling she ever felt. Her eyes rolled back, foam pouring out of her mouth. This feeling was beyond bliss, beyond pleasure. Every millisecond felt like hours of pure ecstasy. From somewhere behind you, the imp from earlier approached. He was holding a bowl, shoving it under the woman's chin. You twisted your stinger, causing even more neurons to fire. She could feel it, her brain melting in the endless drowning river of pleasure. She clenched her teeth, inhaling through them, clenching so hard cracks appeared on them, some of them falling out, falling right next to the ball. As blood began seeping past her lips, she bit off a piece of her tongue, and yet she couldn't stop. She couldn't stop boning, screaming. Her movements became more erratic. And then, from one moment to the next, they ceased entirely. Limp, she sat there. A pink substance 
beginning to pour out of her eyes like tears. The bowl slowly catching the pink liquid as it slowly dripped out of the woman. Personality excretion, the heretical process of sealing oneself, it was permanent, irreversible, leaving the demon a mere husk. This was the power granted to you by hell. It was an ill mutation of memory parasites who were closest demonic relatives, biologically speaking. The overlords in the theater clapped for you, but... One. The little blonde girl next to Alistair, she was... vomiting into a barf bag. How cute. Reminded you a little of yourself. The first time you did this. Oh well. If Alistair had interest in her, she wouldn't need to get used to this. You're sitting in your changing room, smoking a cigarette. On the table in front of you sat a syringe with a glowing pink liquid in it. It was then that a knocking from your door took you out of your thoughts. Sighing, you stood up, walking up to it and opening the door. In front of you stood Valentino. Hey, baby! He sounded excited. Hey, Val. The two of you hugged. You felt his little pair of arms gently rub over your back. That was quite the show, baby! Her moans, they were absolutely delicious! Ugh. I'm so glad you haven't left yet. He let go of you, allowing you to sit back down while he leaned against the table. That little bitch got what she deserved. <laughs> besides, besides, that cute little body of hers is gonna sell for a lot online. You took a drag from your sick and blew it up in the air. Uh huh. You weren't even listening. You're paid for the excretion, and that was it. Um, is that her? He purred. Tactically, you placed an arm before the syringe. Perhaps. What's that to you? Oh, baby, you know I always pay up. I'm just teasing, Val. You smirked. Ugh, it has been tingling in my fingers all week, baby. Oh, it's been a while since the last time someone needed to be excreted, and I need my fix. Excreted personalities could be given to someone via syringe, like any other drug. But this one just had this personal touch, pun not intended. It made people very high, and was very specific to the person that had been extracted from, making it a once-in-a-lifetime deal every time. Remember to savor the taste, Val. Valentino laughed. <laughs> oh, baby, baby. Uh, you're funny, but I know what you mean. Ugh. Dramatically, he slapped his forehead. I still have some left from the second to last one. Oh, God. He shivered. From the moment I felt his liquid enter my body, mm, I knew I had something special. Curiously leaned forward. Oh, really? It's the thought that matters, baby. Eternity and hell, and yet... A finite resource such as this? Not to mention highly addictive, he thought. Though as far as you understood, the simple fact that this stuff had slightly different effects every time meant that it never got old. Perhaps this was just one of Hell's ways to regulate itself outside of exterminations. 
Either way, Valentino, the Pimp Prince of Hell, was a good customer of yours. Arguably the only customer of yours, as very rarely you actually got to sell to anyone but him. He was just always at your door first, and first come, first serve. Well, unless it was a haul like today. A total of three dosages. And finally you allowed him to touch your syringe. Quickly you grabbed it like a snake. Mmm, mmm, mmm! So heavy, you know I like it, baby! A man of your tastes likes it hard and rough, so better give him what he wants. Valentino salivated, just barely managing to swallow it all down before it ran down his grinning teeth. He inhaled, but just managed to put it down. He straightened his back. <sighs> Val was calming down, knowing that he had some stuff now on the back burner. I could kiss you, baby. You smirked. I know you, Val. And I know you will. Actually, he unscrewed the needle of the syringe and put both in a little handbag he was carrying. I was wondering if I could invite you to the Vita for a little, um, one-on-one -on -one party. You grinned. If you want to fuck in the hopes of a discount, you know I don't do discounts. Oh, he stepped back. I'm almost offended, baby. As if I need a discount. But you're right. His long upper arm gently landed on your head, petting you. I wouldn't mind to have you all night to myself, baby. <sighs> you leaned back, puffing more smoke into the air before throwing the leftover bud into your ashtray. Fine, I will come. But... He raised a hand in defense. I know, I know. No trying to dominate you. You're the one in charge. I do what you tell me. <laughs> Good boy. You amused. Standing up, you pecked his cheek. See you tomorrow, then. You left Valentino in your room dumbfounded. I, I, I meant right now, baby. God damn it. You were the only one who could treat him like this. You entered the V-Tower the next day with a confident, almost smug grin on your face. Skipping the reception as the demoness behind it already knew who you were. As you stepped towards the VIP elevator, you heard her distant voice say, uh, The executioner is here, Mr. Vantino. Typing in the familiar code, that would lead the elevator to Valentino's loft. You stepped into the metal casket, stretched yourself as the thing went up. And after hearing the ding and stepping past the metal doors, your eyes fell on Val, who was sitting in his jacuzzi. On a glass table behind him stood a bottle of cheap booze, with a small shot glass, and the syringe. Still filled to the brim. Seems like he managed to control himself until now. How quaint. Hey, baby. He purred. Straight to the point, aren't we? You joked. As if to underline what you said, he stood up, revealing that in fact, he was entirely unclothed. I'm not in the mood just yet, Val. You need to get me there. You chuckled, walking over to his alcohol. Oh, really? He asked, as he looked after you. God, how your butt was wiggling. It made him go crazy. Oh, don't get me wrong, I'm definitely here for that, but... You popped open one of his champagne bottles. You took a glass from his cabinet. His eyes not leaving your body even once. You're dressed no longer in your executioner garb. No, you wore a black kipao dress that showed off your long, slender legs beautifully. Your scarlet hair was pulled up into a tight ponytail, kept in place by a black silk hairband. Luscious red lipstick decorated your lips, and you made sure to wiggle your ass as you walked towards Antino, 
with your drink in hand. Seductively, you took a swig from your glass before pushing it against his mouth. With a smirk, he swallowed. But you only allowed him one gulp before placing the bottle and glass on the table next to the syringe. Ah, oh, baby, you always give me just enough to want more. Uh, why do you do this to me? You smiled at him. Because you let me do this. It seems like I'm the only one you let do this. He burst into laughter, but then stopped. Oh yeah, I don't have your soul, so I quite literally can't do whatever I want with you. And do you hate that? You muttered as your face got closer to his. His eyes moved ever so slightly as he looked into yours. Your nose almost touching his face. His lips quivering into a smile. He inhaled through his mouth, his large tongue rubbed over his teeth, and then he mused. I do. Valentina was a demon of overindulgence, and while you being someone who had power over him turned him on, he was just as much turned on by the thought of quite literally, finally owning you. Of course he realized if he owned you, this game between the two of you would end, or at least would forever be tainted. And sadly, not in a fun way. With your mouth so close together, he could practically feel the heat of your skin radiating against his. It took him a minute, and then he asked. Tell me, Blackwall, do you love me, baby? He said it in a joking way, but you could tell he was deadly serious. In your dreams, moth boy. In the same motion, you pressed your lips on his. Valentino closed his eyes joyfully, humming into you. Your lips felt warm and they tasted like the sweet champagne you drank a minute ago. You separated seconds later. Taking a step back, you took hold of the buttons of your dress, slowly undressing yourself. You know... I see curves all day, baby. You could have just entered without that. You gave him a look that was a mix of disgust and superiority. Well, in that case, why don't I just go if you can replace me so easily? Valentino bit his lower lip. He would refuse to bow to. You would drop your dress on the floor. Well, maybe he could bow to you just once. His eyes narrowed. You knew exactly what he was thinking. And so, instead of making a smug remark, you took the syringe from his table. He was about to protest, but then you climbed into the jacuzzi with him, kneeling onto his lap, the sharp needle dangerously hanging between the gap of your chins. Let's have fun, Valentino. You leaned in for another kiss, while also scraping the needle deliciously over his bare chest. His skin quaked excitedly, tongues intertwining greedily. And you fell into him, his hands caressing your back, while you positioned the syringe just above his shoulder blades behind him. Both of you moaning and groaning in ecstasy. And then... You buried the metal into his flesh. His muscles tensed and he went as far as to bite your tongue. Luckily not hard enough to sever it. That would have ruined the evening for you. Still, it was just enough to draw blood. The metallic, ta the metallic taste of your liquids mixed with your salvia as you pushed the pink liquid into his back. Valentino's eyes rolled. The, the metallic taste of your blood mixed with your salvia as you pushed the pink liquid into him. Valentino's eyes rolled back as he embraced the blissful mixture. The excreted personality was intense, just as he had hoped for. 
and as you pulled the medical tool out of him, carelessly throwing it on the table, his grip on your flesh tightened, Valentino's eyes glowing bright pink. Good. Looks like he was enjoying himself. And it also looked like you'd be sore all over by tomorrow. Thank you for watching my video until the very end. And I would like to remind you to please like and subscribe and comment something down below. I read every comment you write to me and I try to re reply to them as often as I can. But before we say goodbye, I would like to shout out all of my lovely darling stewards who so graciously support my third tier membership. Husky HD 17 Hopeful, Castea Misery, Brie, Zoe, Ikea, Mystic Jade 111, Annabelle R. Contreras, Giovanni Moriarty, Twilight Mia, Angry Boxman, Hella, Bitbit, Melofia, Anonymous Weep, and Nicodemus D. Thank you so much for your continued support. And finally, I'd like to thank all of my lovely darling mates for also supporting me financially. I couldn't do this without you. Thank you very much for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a nice day and please remember to like and subscribe.